Jeffrey Allen Frankel arrived to Mom and Dad nearly 64 and a half years ago. Mom and Dad had an amazing time. I had a real sense that Jeff was supposed to be a present for my second birthday, but he came two days late. Nevertheless, as little guys, we were extremely tight, often cuddling in bed when we went to sleep at night, being dressed in matching outfits for special events, and all, the, all other ways that toddler brothers of the 50s hung out together. From the start, Jeff was a bit of a contradiction in terms. While I have referred to him as my little brother, that term hardly makes a difference. As I'm the oldest of four sons, of course he was a kid brother, but from good age order, nearly from infancy and until his illness began his destruction, Jeff was physically bigger than me. One of my fondest memories of Jeff as an infant was before he was even three months old, seated on the dining room table at the home of Mom's adopted parents, the Rossbergs. Jeff was a butterball. He had already more than tripled birth weight on no more than my mother's milk, and he was happy as could be as is easily observed in the photo. Jeff remained large. Growing up in Philadelphia, Jeff had to be taken to the Husky store on the other side of the city for his clothing. He was big in every way. Most probably, though, most probably, though, thought he was fat. Never. He was just big. He was a stark, pure muscle. I think he enjoyed goading me into fighting as a kid because he had no trouble lifting me over his head and throwing me across the room. Theoretically, as the firstborn, I was supposed to be the smart one. But Jeff always knew which buttons to push. As children, Jeff and I both attended elementary school at Philadelphia Solomon Schachter. I loved it. Jeff, not so much. It seemed far too often that Mrs. Grinchlaw's Jeff's first grade teacher would call up to me from the third grade classroom to come down to help Jeff with this or that, as if I knew how. It brought issues no third grade, no third grader should know about to my attention. But it also bonded Jeff and I more closely. Jeff only lasted a year at Schechter, but when he left and went on to be a student at my father's religious school, he knew his way around. Dad uh, had used both Jeff and I as aides for years in keeping the place organized. When Dad left to go on to the Board of Jewish Education, the OCJC Hebrew School, would not have survived were it not for Jeff's input. He won awards for the way he kept the place organized and was a needed facet of the school's ongoing operation. He may not have been much of a student, but he knew how to get things done. Jeff has always gotten more done than what that was expected of him. He learned to read Torah as a child, even if he never enjoyed it. I know he knew how, as I was the one to teach him and I helped him master the short aliyot that he read at his bar mitzvah celebration, which was on a Rosh Chodesh, as it still is today. As today it is. He also learned to daven weekday shachrit, and he never lost the skill. That he never lost the skill seems peculiar. While for me and Danny and David, sure was like a home away from home, it never was for Jeff. Yet when he lived his last few years in the Gurren nursing home on Long Island, as long as he was able, Jeff could be counted upon to come down in his wheelchair to make a minion. He often dived before the omen. I was startled when I learned about this during a visit and had to go find Jeff at the center's shore. As a kid, Jeff was thought to be slow. Back then, the world did not have a sophisticated and understanding of learning disabilities as it does today. Jeff's achievements over the years demonstrated far more than anyone of his childhood would have expected. Jeff was anything but slow. He just marched to a different drum. Jeff picked up Lauren's chauffeur for the first time as a bar mitzvah bomber. He blew that ram forward with the best of them. But not blowing the usual chauffeur blast of the liturgy, he could be heard blowing the sounds of Herb Albert. I think he mastered Petruva cards downtown before he learned to do a proper trua. We were taught that Jeff had issues with math and arithmetic. The funny thing was, he was masterful with any numbers that had a dollar sign before them. Practically from the first job he held, mowing the hilly front yards of row houses in Philadelphia or babysitting for friends in the neighborhood. Jeff truly came into his own when the family moved to Ohio. Jeff trained and excelled as a body mechanic with a specialty in painting. Jeff was such a masterful painter that luxury dealership sent their best cars to Jeff for repainting at Jeff's auto body instead of relying on their own body shops. 
Were he not legislated out of business by the township where his shop was located, Jeff would not have been as close as he came to me with Don Kent. With Kent, Jeff went, went from being a body mechanic to an outstanding outside salesman of auto paint and related products. Jeff had the gift of gab and also was able to demonstrate how to effectively paint, never stopping himself from donning a pair of coveralls to show a potential customer the craft. He even recorded several video demonstration tapes. It was also as a painter and salesman that Jeff again demonstrated his amazing ingenuity. He invented an anti-static additive for paint to stop paint from attracting dust particles during the painting and drying processes. His product, first called Anti-Stat and then Anti-Stat 2, puzzled the industry. It did not come from a major producer, a lab, or anyone that they knew, and yet it outperformed competitive products on the market. He upgraded Anti-Stat to make it resistant to freezing temperatures. All of this without a science degree or training in chemistry. Yet when needed, Jeff could hit the books and experiment with the best of them. My son Josh, Josh, my son Josh used to refer to Jeff as rich uncle buddy. Jeff was single, relatively comfortable, and whenever he visited us, he came with a nice gift. For Josh, Jeff may not have been rich, but he was always generous with what he had. Jeff never deserved to be stricken by the muscular sclerosis that eventually failed him, and that has been part of Jeff for most of the last 30 years. Jeff's MS was especially virulent and did not allow him to do the work he loved or the other pleasures many take for granted. Yet even the MS, at least for a few years, was a cloud with a silver lining. Without MS, Jeff would not have developed his MS Protocols website in which he described, developed, and sold natural remedies to help others plague with the malady. Jeff was a devoted, practicing Jew throughout his life, and his devotion to his heritage was clear to all who got to know him. Shabbos was Shabbos for Jeff, even if he was not a show goer and hated seeking spirits. He always maintained a kosher home, and in the, and in the days when he entertained clients, it was a kosher restaurant. In fact, Jeff may have been the first to learn that the kosher restaurant in Cleveland was serving trace meat because the cook there refused to let Jeff be scammed by the restaurant's owner. That switch of meat caused quite a ruhaha in the early 80s in Cleveland. Jeff had a life that was far too hard, but to the end, I think Jeff enjoyed his life and just felt his was the hand that the Cottage Boyle group dealt him. The last time I saw him was only a few weeks ago. At that time, he was not yet deaf as he was to be when he passed. We spoke to Jeff and he responded with grunts and motions that let us know he understood. Even then, Anne and I saw the ever present gleam in his eyes and the smile on his face. In many ways, Jeff was a spiritual descendant of Nahu Ishkatsu, who found the best he could in all that he experienced. Jeff was always cheerful and moving cheeks, with a smile on his face that often demonstrated that Jeff was a pure Hasid of Shammai, who taught us to greet all others with a cheerful face. Jeff was atypical in so many ways, but he was a mensch. I would give anything to hear him again sustain his minute-long Takiya Gidola chauffeur blast, which he did so often as a teenager in Cincinnati. Jeff, give my best to Dad when you see him upstairs. You will be missed. Jeff was born on October 19, 1955, and was the second of our parents, four boys. He and my older brother Edwin would fight like cats and dogs, or rather, cowboys and Indians, and Edwin has the mark on his forehead to show for it. In one particular fight, I remember accidentally becoming Jeff's human shield, blocking a thrown shoe with my head during another spectacular fight that he was having with Edwin. Jeff was eight years older than me, and I remember following him all around. As I understand it, he had challenges in school. He received a basic Jewish education, learned his lessons, and as you've heard, led Shacharit service and learned the Torah when he celebrated becoming a bar mitzvah. He didn't go to shul very often when we were kids. However, he observed kashrut, and in his later years, I'm told he occasionally attended services at Gerwin. For me, 
These are mostly stories that I've heard but don't remember, as I was either too young when they happened, with the exception of the shoe that is, or not present. I do remember Jeff going to public high school and eventually a vocational high school in Cincinnati called Quarter Tech. I remember Jeff being very hardworking and entrepreneurial, having a lawn mowing service, a snow blowing service, and auto body shop. I think he even tried to start a home cleaning business. He was also an inventor and produced a few products, his best and most successful called Antistat. He also had several body shop jobs and was an amazing car painter. Finally, he remade himself as an auto body supply salesman and was one of the best in the tri-state region. He practiced what he preached and could show body men how to use his products. This turned heads and earned him, and earned him a substantial book of business. Then came multiple sclerosis. It was very scary when Jeff received his diagnosis of MS and worse, watching it slowly ravage his body and soul. Jeff was my hero and one of my teachers. He let me tag along with him when we cut yards and taught me so that I could do it when I was old enough. He also let me work in, at his body shop and taught me some of the business, enough that I could work in the industry if I ever desired or needed to. It was amazing to help him fix and paint cars. He was an amazing painter. The best part, however, was being able to spend time with him. The car rides back and forth were full of singing and laughter. The times in the shop were hard work, but mostly fun, for a teenager that is. For Jeff, it was always hard work. He also taught me the automotive and sales industry and got me a summer job as a traveling salesman selling material out of the back of my car in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Jeff gave me a 10-speed bike and my first and second cars. We fixed up both cars and, paid, and painted them in his body shop. They were amazing and I was very proud to show them off. My earliest memory of rock music was from listening to Jeff, or listening to it on Jeff's radio. He shared Chicago, Earth, Wind & Fire, Blue Oyster Cult, Herb Albert, Al Hurt, and several other bands and musicians with me. He shared his love of trumpet with me, so I learned to play it in school. He was also a premier chauffeur blower with a tequila gadola that I've never heard matched. While possibly inappropriate, he could also blow the song on Broadway on the shofar. Jeff was a gentle and caring person. I know he helped his friends when they ran short financially and rescued a few damsels in distress. Fortunately, my girls, Katie, Sydney, and Sarah, and my wife, Jody, were able to know Jeff before his MS got very bad. Jeff was more than my brother. He was one of my best friends. He had a playful streak, which sometimes went too far, and at times ended with someone, David or me, crying, but that is another story. As brothers living at home, we certainly had our moments and challenges. However, as adults, he was my confidant and friend. He was there for me during, mo during some of my most difficult challenges, supporting me emotionally and assuring me that I was doing the right thing and on the right track. What I have missed most about Jeff is being able to talk to him. He was my go-to guy. For the last few years, his MS made it nearly impossible to have a conversation with him. Now our conversations will be one-sided, but at least I know he is free of his physical impairment or imprisonment. I hope he, Yitzhak Ben Mayer, is with our father, Mayor Ben Yitzchak, and able to enjoy the beauty of Olam Haba. I'll do my best to keep my reflections brief, since today, the day of Jeff's funeral is Rosh Chodesh, and as such, it's not really a time for extended eulogies. As I think of my life without Jeff, I can't help but feel incomplete, like a part of me has also gone missing. You see, ever since I was a little boy, part of my core identity was as one of the four Frankel boys. During our Pesach Seders growing up, I can still recall how Dad would divide up the reading parts for the Arba Banim. Dad always read the Russia section himself because he was quick to remind us that there were no Rashaim amongst the four Frankel boys. It's unimaginable to think that the four Frankel boys are no more. Danny assures me that we'll always be the four boys, but I know it'll never be the same. We all had so many fun times together, and the silly nicknames we had for each other, Meshugi, Mugana, <laughs> and of course, you were Mugumba. There were worse nicknames to be sure, but this is a peachy audience. From the time I was a little boy, the bedrooms that my brothers and I shared were always connected. As my bedtime was considerably earlier than Jeff's, 
I can remember how I sneakily watched the TV that was in his room by positioning a mirror at just the right angle to be viewed in my adjoining room. As a kid, I was very grateful to Jeff for allowing me to pirate his TV when I should have been asleep. I also fondly remember turning 16 and how excited my brother was to surprise me with a new car that he had bought just for me. A new car. Is there anything more wonderful for a 16-year-old boy than having his own car? There are no words to express my gratitude then or now. Sadly, I totaled that car only a few years later, but I can't remember Jeff even mumbling one negative statement about my carelessness. Yes, there was occasional ribbing that I mercilessly endured through the years, but my mental image of my brother Jeff is one filled to overflowing with humor and joy. Of course, that all changed when my brother was diagnosed with MS. The disease thoroughly ravaged my brother and reduced him to a shell of his former self. And to think that once upon a time, he was an ox of a man. Like a circus performer, I can still remember how he'd lay flat on his back, have us kids one at a time stand on his hands, and he'd lift each of us straight into the air. As I look back on Jeff's life, it occurs to me that he purposely chose to live with or near to each of his three brothers at some time. When Edwin was first married, there was a time when Jeff lived with him in Florida. Years later, Jeff lived with Danny, And then Danny set up Jeff near him in a condo in Atlanta. And then 11 years ago, Jeff allowed me to relocate him from his home in Fort Myers, Florida, to a Jewish nursing home in Long Island when he was unable to care for himself. It gave us both more opportunities to grow closer and to share each other's lives. And it gave my wife and my beautiful three daughters the opportunity to know and love their uncle Jeffy. Although it wasn't easy for him, it was especially meaningful to him and to us when my brother attended my youngest daughter Miriam's bat mitzvah celebration four years ago. I can still picture him wearing a silly cowboy hat at my daughter's square dance themed party. He loved my daughter so much and he was always happiest when I told him stories about their school plays and science fairs and graduations. He felt the same way about all of his nieces and nephews. So much love. Sadly, Jeff's mobility and independence was stolen by Atmos, but his love grew in equal proportion to his disability. I know we will all miss him enormously, but it's fitting that his burial would be on Rosh Chodesh Adar. This month is known for Simcha, and Simcha was Jeff's chief personality trait. I love you, Jeff, and I suspected that your end was near during our last visit together. As I told you then, when I held your face and kissed you goodbye, I was blessed to have you in my life, and your humor and zest for life will forever influence me. I love you, big brother, and I'll miss you every day. I'm not much of a public speaker. In fact, I find it really intimidating. But Rabbi Goldsmith at Shalavim, the seminary which I attended in Israel for my year, always says that we're all family here. And since I'm not able to go back home to be with my biological family during this life-altering event, as I'm in Israel, I thought that the next best thing would be to share my thoughts with all of you. My uncle, my dad's brother, was taken from us on Sunday morning. He went by many names. To some he was Jeffrey, to others Jeff or Jeffy. To my father, Magumba, a silly nickname to match his personality. But to me and my sisters, he was always known as Uncle Jeffy. Uncle Jeffy was one of the most positive and hysterically funny people I have ever met. And this was definitely not a given as he had the very opposite of an easy life. My uncle was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, a disease that progressively worsened as time went on. It's a disease that attacks the nervous system and left him almost completely paralyzed and wheelchair bound. Over time, even his speech started to slur and it was hard to understand him right away. But as far as I know, he never let this get the best of him. He always had a smile on his face and a funny joke or comment to share. He and my dad would always goof around, lovingly insulting each other as a game. We all knew they weren't serious. Several years ago, when I was still pretty little, my uncle was moved to a nursing home in Long Island to be closer to our family and to receive better medical care. 
My sisters and I were so excited by this. We hadn't really gotten the opportunity to meet him up until that point, and we were not disappointed. Uncle Jeffy greeted us each individually with a huge smile, wearing his signature bright colors and cartoon character sweatpants, and proudly led the way, barreling down the halls of Gerwin Jewish Center, past all the stationary patients, pieces of furniture, and the walls of photography in his electric wheelchair. And let me tell you, it was a sight to be seen. You did not want to get in Uncle Jeffy's way. My dad always joked that he was a crazy driver, and everyone better watch out and stand clear. Otherwise, you just might get run over. Even from the start of his residence there, it seemed that everyone knew his name and his reputation, including the doctors, nurses, secretaries, and residents. Who couldn't like Uncle Jeffy? He brought the excitement and laughter into their work and their lives. As my father used to say, he was the mayor of Gerwin. Visits to see him as a kid were always exciting for us. But let's be honest, the extra special Uncle Jeffy food was a nice incentive. We'd always visit him at lunchtime and take him into the separate brown bag room, where you ate the food that was brought from off the premises. One of his challenges was that he had some food intolerances. Gluten was one of them. So we started out with some pizza, a special gluten-free pie bought just for him. Soon we graduated to Chinese food, and as some of you may know, I have a slight obsession with Chinese. Uncle Jeffy's order was always sesame chicken. My dad would help feed him the food and was always a bit scared for the state of his fingers when Uncle Jeffy went at it. He was worried that at the end of the meal he might be missing one or two. Fingers, that is. It was a given that there would not be any chicken left over at the end of the meal. We would chat with him and tell him about our latest achievements. My dad would brag about us kids and we would grin back at him as Uncle Jeffy gave us a look of pride or a shared mischievous glance. Uncle Jeffy was always the top jokester of any room the first to lighten the mood. He constantly reminded me not to take life too seriously or to let the little things get me down. Something that I struggle with and something that I hope to master just as he did. If Uncle Jeffy could do it, I certainly could. He had every right to be angry or depressed with his lot in life and yet he would be the one to cheer other people up. I think it's only fitting that he passed away when he did, right before Chodesh Adar, the month of Adar in the Jewish calendar ushering in the month that is known as the month of Simcha, joy, cheer, and laughter. Though of course it deeply saddens me that he couldn't live to see the coming of the new month. As I said, Uncle Jeffy was always the fire starter, the first to start the rounds of laughter with his jokes before anyone else. In the same way that he was taken from this world before anyone else could kick off their Purim festivities and shtick. Purim is also the holiday in which we celebrate our salvation from the vicious hands of the evil Haman. So too, I am relieved to know that Uncle Jeffy has been freed from under the oppressive hand of his own personal pain. Though I selfishly wish that we could hold on to him longer, his relief was only made possible when he was separated from his physical body and his limitations in this world. I think that my uncle would probably laugh at me if he heard all the little things that stuck with me from our visits, but most especially from the fact that I just spent the last few minutes praising him to all of you. I don't think he understood how admirable his unwavering positivity was, and what a great impression that it made on me and all the people that he came into contact with. Nevertheless, I felt the need to express how much I miss him, and how much he meant to me and my family. So I'm, spe- so I'm sponsoring tonight's learning. Lizechar Yitzchak ben Mayor Frankel, and I hope that you all got to appreciate a small taste of Uncle Jeffy's personality and can learn from some of the midot or personality traits that he so naturally lived and breathed.